something, somewhere, somewhen, must have happened differently. Petunia Evans married Michael Varis, a professor of biochemistry at Oxford. Harry James Potter Evans Varis grew up in a house filled to the brim with books. He once bit a math teacher who didn't know what a logarithm was. He's read Gödel, Escher, Bach, and Judgment Under Uncertainty, Heuristics and Biases, and Volume 1 of the Feynman Lectures on Physics. And despite what everyone who's met him seems to fear, he doesn't want to become the next Dark Lord. He was raised better than that. He wants to discover the laws of magic and become a god. Hermione Granger is doing better than him in every class, except broomstick riding. Draco Malfoy is exactly what you would expect an 11-year-old boy to be like if Darth Vader were his doting father. Professor Quirrell is living his lifelong dream of teaching defense against the dark arts, or as he prefers to call his class, battle magic. His students are all wondering what's going to go wrong with the defense professor this time. Dumbledore is either insane or playing some vastly deeper game which involves setting fire to a chicken. Deputy Headmistress Minerva McGonagall needs to go off somewhere private and scream for a while. Presenting Harry Potter and the Methods of Rationality. You ain't guessing where this one's going. Minerva and Dumbledore together had applied their combined talent to conjure the grand stage toward which Quirrell now slowly trudged. Minerva ordinarily enjoyed the few occasions when she had the occasion to tire herself out on large transfigurations. She should have enjoyed the many small chances for artistry, the illusion of opulence. But this time she had done the work with the dreadful feeling of digging her own grave. But Minerva was feeling a little better now. There'd been one brief moment when the explosion might have come. But Dumbledore had already been standing up and applauding warmly, and no one had proven foolish enough to riot in front of the headmaster. And the explosive mood had rapidly faded into a collective sentiment which might perhaps have been described by the phrase, Give us a break! Blaze Abini had shot himself in the name of Sunshine, and the final score had been 254 to 254 to 254. Behind the stage, waiting to ascend, three children were glaring each other in mingled fury and frustration. It didn't help that they were still damp from being fished out of the lake, and that the warming charms didn't seem quite enough to make up for the crisp December air. Or maybe it was just their mood. That's it! I've had it! No more traitors! I completely agree with you, Miss Granger. Enough is enough. And what do you two intend to do about it? Professor Quirrell already said he wouldn't ban spies. We'll ban them for him. He hadn't even understood what he meant by the words as he said them, but the very act of speaking seemed to crystallize a plan. Professor Quirrell had... awakened, or whatever it was he did. With evident showmanship, the defense professor was carefully stacking and squaring those three envelopes containing the three parchments upon which the three generals had written their wishes as all the students of Hogwarts watched and waited. Well, this is inconvenient. I suppose you are all wondering what I will do. There is nothing for it. I shall have to do what is fair. Although first there was a little speech I wanted to make, and before even that it appears to me that Mr. Malfoy and Miss Granger have something they wish to share. Draco blinked, and then he and Granger traded rapid glances. May I? Yes, go ahead. And Draco raised his voice. General Granger and I would both like to say that we will no longer accept the help of any traitors. And if, in any battle, we find that Potter has accepted traitors from either of our armies, we will join forces to crush him. And Draco shot a glance filled with malice at the boy who lived. Take that, General Chaos. I agree completely with General Malfoy. Neither of us will use traitors, and if General Potter does, we will wipe him off the battlefield. There was a susurration of surprise from the watching students. Very good. It took the two of you long enough, but you are still to be congratulated for having thought of it before any other generals. In the future, Mr. Malfoy, Miss Granger, before you come to my office with any request, consider whether there is a way for you to accomplish it without my help. I will not deduct quirl points on this occasion, but next time, you may expect to lose the full 50. 
And what do you have to say about that, Mr. Potter? The Chaos Legion is still happy to accept traitors. See you on the battlefield. Draco knew the shock was showing on his own face. There were astonished murmurs from the watching students. Even Harry's chaotic looked taken aback. Mr. Potter, are you trying to be obnoxious? Most certainly not. I won't make you do it every time. Beat me once, and I'll stay beaten. But threats aren't always enough, General of Sunshine. You did not ask me to join with you, but tried simply to impose your will. And sometimes you must actually defeat the enemy to impose your will on him. You see, I am skeptical that Hermione Granger, the brightest academic star of Hogwarts, and Draco, son of Lucius, scion of the noble and most ancient house of Malfoy, can work together to beat their common foe, Harry Potter. Maybe I'll just do what Draco tried with Zabini and write a letter to Lucius Malfoy and see what he thinks about that. Draco controlled the anger flushing through him. That had been a stupid move on Harry's part, saying that in public. If Harry had simply done it, it might have worked. Draco hadn't even thought about that. But now if Father did that, it would look like he was playing into Harry's hands. If you think my father, Lord Malfoy, can be manipulated by you that easily, you have a surprise coming, Harry Potter. And Draco realized as the words finished leaving his mouth that he'd just backed his own father squarely into the corner, more or less without even meaning to. Father probably wasn't going to like this, not the tiniest bit. But now it would be impossible for him to say so. Draco would have to apologize for that. It had been an honest accident, but it was strange to think that he'd done it at all. Then go ahead and defeat the evil General Chaos. I can't win against both your armies, not if you really work together. But I wonder if perhaps I could break you up before then. You won't, and we'll crush you. Hermione Granger firmly nodded. Well, that was not how I expected that particular conversation to go. Truthfully, Mr. Potter, I expected you to concede immediately and with a smile, then announce that you had long since worked out my intended lesson but had decided not to spoil it for others. Indeed, I planned my speech accordingly, Mr. Potter. Oh, don't worry. This too will serve and Professor Quirrell turned from the three children to address the whole watching crowd. His customary air of detached amusement dropped away like a falling mask, and when he spoke again his voice was amplified louder than it had been. If not for Harry Potter, you know who would have won. The silence was instant and total. Make no mistake, the Dark Lord was winning. There were fewer and fewer Aurors who dared face him. The vigilantes who opposed him were being hunted down. One Dark Lord and perhaps fifty Death Eaters were winning against a country of thousands. That is beyond ridiculous. There are no grades low enough for me to mark that incompetence. Do you understand now how it happened? You saw it today. I allowed traitors and gave the generals no means to restrain them. You saw the result. Clever plots and clever betrayals until the last soldier left on the battlefield shot himself. You cannot possibly doubt that all three of those armies could have been defeated by any outside foe that was unified within itself. Division is weakness. Unity is strength. The Dark Lord understood that well, whatever his other follies and he used that understanding to create the one simple invention that made him the most terrible Dark Lord in history. Your parents faced one Dark Lord, and fifty Death Eaters who were perfectly united, knowing that any breach of their loyalty would be punished by death, that any slack or incompetence would be punished by pain. None could escape the Dark Lord's grasp once they took his mark. And the Death Eaters agreed to take that terrible mark because they knew that once they took it, they would be united, facing a divided land. One Dark Lord and fifty Death Eaters would have defeated an entire country by the power of the Dark Mark. Your parents could have fought back in kind. They did not. There was a man named Yermi Wibble who called upon the nation to institute a draft, though he did not quite have vision enough to propose a Mark of Britain. Yermi Wibble knew what would happen to him. He hoped his death would inspire others. So the Dark Lord took his family for good measure. 
Their empty skins inspired nothing but fear, and no one dared to speak again. And your parents would have faced the consequences of their despicable cowardice, if not for being saved by a one-year-old boy. A dramatist would have called that a de ex machina, for they did nothing to earn their salvation. He who must not be named may not have deserved to win, but make no doubt of it, your parents deserved to lose. And know this, your parents have learned nothing. The nation is still fragmented and weak. How few decades passed between Grindwald and you-know-who. Do you think you will not see the next threat in your own lifetimes? Will you repeat the follies of your parents when you have seen the results so clearly laid out before you this day? For I can tell you what your parents will do when the day of darkness comes. I can tell you what lesson they have learned. They have learned to hide like cowards and do nothing while they wait for Harry Potter to save them. Mark this, and mark it well. He who must not be named wished to rule over this country, to hold it in his cruel grasp forever. But at least he wished to rule over a living country and not a heap of ash. There have been dark lords who were mad, who wished only to make the world a vast funeral pyre. There have been wars in which one whole country marched against another. Your parents nearly lost against half a hundred who thought to take this country alive. How quickly would they have been crushed by a foe more numerous than they, a foe that cared for nothing but their destruction? This I foretell. When the next threat rises, Lucius Malfoy will claim that you must follow him or perish, that your only hope is to trust in his cruelty and strength. And though Lucius Malfoy himself will believe it, this will be a lie. For when the Dark Lord perished, Lucius Malfoy did not unite the Death Eaters. They were shattered in an instant. They fled like whipped dogs and betrayed each other. Lucius Malfoy is not strong enough to be a true lord, dark or otherwise. No, I do not think it will be Lucius Malfoy who saves you. And lest you think that I speak on my own behalf, time will make clear soon enough that this is not so. I make no recommendation, my students. But I say that if a whole country were to find a leader as strong as the Dark Lord, but honorable and pure, and take his mark, then they could crush any Dark Lord like an insect, and all the rest of our divided magical world could not threaten them. And if some still greater enemy rose against us in a war of extermination, then only a united magical world could survive. I do not say what threat will come, but you will not all live your lives in peace. Not if the past history of the world is any guide at all to its future. And if you do in the future, as you have seen three armies do this day, if you cannot throw aside your petty bickerings and take the mark of a single leader, then indeed you might wish that the Dark Lord had lived to rule over you and regret the day that ever Harry Potter was born. Enough! There was silence. Professor Quirrell slowly turned his head to gaze at where Albus Dumbledore stood in the fury of his wizardry. Their eyes met, and a soundless stress pressed down like weight upon all the students as they listened, not daring to move. You, too, failed this country, and you know the peril as well as I. Such speeches are not for the ears of students, nor for the mouths of professors. There were many speeches made for the ears of adults as the Dark Lord rose, and the adults clapped and cheered and went home having enjoyed their day's entertainment. But I will obey you, Headmaster, and make no further speeches if you do not like them. My lesson is simple. I will go on doing nothing about traitors, and we will see what students can do for themselves about that, when they do not wait for professors to save them. And then Professor Quirrell turned back to his students but do please be kind to the traitors up until now. They were just having fun. There was laughter, though it was nervous at first, and then it seemed to build as Professor Quirrell stood there smiling wryly and some of the tension released itself. Draco's mind was still whirling through a thousand questions and a daze of horror as Professor Quirrell prepared to open the envelopes in which the three had inscribed their wishes. It had never before occurred to Draco that moon-traveling muggles were a greater threat than the slow decline of wizardry, or that Father had proved himself too weak to stop them. And even stranger, the obvious implication, Professor Quirrell believed that Harry could. The defense professor claimed to have made no recommendation, but he'd mentioned Harry Potter over and over in his speech. Others would already be thinking the same thing as Draco. 
It was ridiculous. The boy who had covered a stuffed chair in glitter and called it a throne. The boy who faced down Snape and won. That boy could grow into a lord strong enough to rule. Strong enough to save us all. Harry had been raised by muggles. He was practically a mudblood himself. He wouldn't fight against his adopted family. He knows their arts, their secrets, and their methods. He can take all of the muggle science and use it against them, alongside our own power as wizards. But what if he refuses? What if he's too weak? Then it will have to be you, won't it, Draco Malfoy? And then there was a renewed hush from the crowd as Professor Quirrell opened the first envelope. Mr. Malfoy, your wish is for... Slytherin to win the House Cup. There was a puzzled pause from the watching audience. Yes, Professor. If you can't do that, then something else for Slytherin. I will not award house points unfairly, which makes your wish difficult enough to be interesting. Would you like to say anything about why, Mr. Malfoy? Not all of Slytherin had cheered for Dragon Army. There were anti-Malfoy factions who had expressed that dissatisfaction by supporting the boy who lived, or even Granger. And those factions would be encouraged greatly by what Zabini had done. He needed to remind them that Slytherin meant Malfoy, and Malfoy meant Slytherin. No, they're Slytherins. They'll understand. There was some laughter from the audience, especially in Slytherin, even from some students who would have called themselves anti-Malfoy a moment earlier. Flattery was a lovely thing. And for Miss Granger, your wish is for... Ravenclaw to win the House Cup? There was considerable laughter from the audience, including a chuckle from Draco. He hadn't thought Granger played that game. Well, um, I meant to say that there were soldiers from every house in my army, and I don't mean to slight any of them, but houses should still count for something, too. It was sad when students in the same house were hexing each other just because they were in different armies. People should be able to rely on whoever's in their house. That's why Godric Gryffindor and Salazar Slytherin and Rowena Ravenclaw and Helga Hufflepuff created the four houses of Hogwarts in the first place. I'm the General of Sunshine, but even before that, I'm Hermione Granger of Ravenclaw, and I'm proud to be a part of a house that's 800 years old. Well said, Miss Granger. An interesting sentiment, Miss Granger. But there are times when it is good for a Slytherin to have friends in Ravenclaw, or for a Gryffindor to have friends in Hufflepuff. Surely it would be best if you could rely both on your friends in your house, and also your friends in your army? Granger's eyes flicked briefly toward the watching students and teachers, and she said nothing. And Mr. Potter wishes for... There was a pause as Professor Quirrell looked at the parchment. Please confine yourself to the possible, Mr. Potter. There was a long pause. Harry, standing beside Draco, looked rather shaken. What in Merlin's name did he ask for? I do hope that you prepared another wish, if I could not grant that one. I didn't, but I already thought of another one. People fear traitors because of the damage the traitor does directly, the soldiers they shoot, or the secrets they tell. But that's only part of the danger. What people do because they're afraid of traitors also costs them. I used that strategy today against Sunshine and Dragon. I didn't tell my traitors to cause as much direct damage as possible. I told them to act in a way that would create the most distrust and confusion and make the generals do the most costly things to try and stop them from doing it again. When there are just a few traitors and a whole country opposing them, it stands to reason that what a few traitors do might be less damaging than what a whole country does to stop them, that the cure might be worse than the disease. Mr. Potter, the lesson of history is that you are simply wrong. Your parents' generation did too little to unify themselves, not too much. This whole country almost fell, Mr. Potter, though you were not there to see it. I suggest that you ask your doormates in Ravenclaw how many of them have lost family to the Dark Lord. Or if you are wiser, do not ask. Do you have a wish to make, Mr. Potter? If you don't mind, I should like to hear what the boy who lived has to say. He has more experience than either of us at stopping wars. A few people laughed, but not many. I'm not saying you're wrong, Professor Quirrell. In the last war, people didn't act together, and a whole country almost fell to a few dozen attackers. And yes, that was pathetic. And if we make the same mistake next time, yes, that'll be even more pathetic. 
but you never fight the same war twice. And the problem is, the enemy is also allowed to be smart. If you're divided, you're vulnerable in one way, but when you try to unite, then you face other risks and other costs. And the enemy will try to take advantage of those, too. You can't stop thinking at just one level of the game. Simplicity also has a great deal to commend it, Mr. Potter. I do hope that you have learned something this day about the dangers of strategies more complicated than uniting your people and attacking your enemy. And if all this does not tie into your wish somehow, I shall be quite annoyed. Yes, it was pretty difficult coming up with a wish to symbolize the costs of unity. But the problem of acting together isn't just for wars, it's something we have to solve all our lives every day. If everyone is coordinating using the same rules, and the rules are stupid, then if one person decides to do things differently, they're breaking the rules. And if you thought that the only important thing was that people should always be unified, then you could never change the game, no matter how stupid the rules. So my own wish, to symbolize what happens when people unite in the wrong direction, is that in Hogwarts, we should play Quidditch without the snitch. The snitch ruins the whole game. Everything the other players do ends up being irrelevant. It would make overwhelmingly more sense to just buy a clock. It's one of those incredibly stupid things you don't notice just because you grew up with it, that people only do because everyone else is doing it. The ride ended about 15 seconds later, after a gigantic spout of fire blasted out of the highest tower of Hogwarts to the sound of a hundred thunders. Draco hadn't known Dumbledore could do that. The students sat down again, very carefully and quietly. Professor Kroll was laughing without pause. So be it, Mr. Potter. Your will be done. Of course, I only promised one cunning plot. And that is all the three of you will get. You mean, we have to all agree on a wish? Oh, that would be far too much to ask. The three of you have no common enemy, do you? For one brief moment, so fast that Draco thought he might have imagined it, the defense professor's eyes flicked in the direction of Dumbledore. No, I mean that I shall grant three wishes using a single plot. You can't do that. Not even I can do that. Two of those wishes are mutually incompatible. It's logically impossible. You're a few years too young to tell me what I can't do, Mr. Potter. Then the defense professor turned back to the watching students. Truthfully, I have no confidence in your ability to learn from this day's lesson. Go home and enjoy your time with your families, or what's left of them, while they still live. My own family is long since dead at the Dark Lord's hand. I shall see you all when classes resume. But you, Mr. Potter, I would speak to now.